Uh, we have eight participants so far. Um, all right, yeah, they're starting to pile in. Uh, hello, everybody, thank you for joining us today. We're just gonna give it another minute or so, let some people come into the room. Um, I guess I'll start with some uh, you know, brief introductions. This is the NYC GPA IPM workshop. Um, we have the very intelligent and very smart, very talented Heather Case with us. Um, my name is Eric Carbone. I am the chair of the edu co chair of the education committee. Um, I myself am a farmer, as some of you know. For those of you who don't, I've been cultivating hemp for the last four years. Uh, lucky enough to be granted one of the AUCC licenses. So we have our first cannabis crop in the ground this year. Very exciting. Uh, I'm personally excited for this workshop the most because, in my opinion, this is probably one of the most vital things we need to know and need to brush up on. Some of you may know this already, but you know nobody knows everything. And even if you learn one little thing, it can help you exponentially in the end. Um, I'm going to let introduce. I'm going to introduce Paul. Uh, Paul Elstrom. He is a member of the education committee as well, and just overall badass farmer up in uh, <laughs> up in the Niagara region. And uh, Paul, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, well, thanks for the opportunity, Eric, and thanks for everybody for joining us. My name is Paul Elstrom. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Wefield Gardens, and our new uh, cannabis name is going to be True Can. So uh, Heather and I are coming to you live from our farm here outside of Buffalo, New York. And it's really great that we're here because Eric is has so much experience outdoor farming, and we here at, at, Green, at Wefield Gardens, we're all about uh, glasshouse farming. So um we you know there's some advantages to to growing in a glass house it extends the season but it also keeps the bug it's a very hospitable environment for invasive species so um having the 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 knowledge and this entire industry of integrated pest management is developing uh side by side as the cannabis industry just explodes and it's it's people like heather case who who uh farmers like myself rely on for consultation and this is just a process this is an never ending battle you will never beat all the bugs i can tell you that i've been farm like eric i've been farming hemp for four years and it's always there there's always pressure but it's all about managing that pressure and that's why we're super excited to have heather here to just share some really um you know there's this is a whole field of study but i think we'll keep it to the 101 level yes so that people coming to this will you know get an idea of what what the techniques are and what and more i think most importantly eric i'd love to dive into like what not to do to in order to pass a test so i think we'll cover all that in this webinar and i just hope everyone enjoys it and i think now we'll give uh, heather a chance to introduce herself and yes, we'll get last but not least Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Thank you um, to this group for having me. And thank you to Paul and Wheatfield Gardens for hosting me. I'm really excited to be sharing this information with y'all. Um, just a, qu a quick brief introduction about myself. There's a little bit more info in the slide. I've been in IPM for four years or five years now. Um, and I come from Rochester, New York. So if there's any Rochester people in there, um, nice to have you, nice to have everybody. And I currently come from the Hudson Valley of New York State. So if there's anyone on this that's down there, let me know and I will come to your farm. I'd love to, um, I'd love to come to anyone's farm. But I'm really excited, like I said, to be here and um, I feel very grateful. And I will say if one big thing that you take away from this presentation is knowledge is power and you're always going to be learning more and there's not a limit to what you can learn so don't feel you know um bad if you you like oh i don't know something um you're gonna learn for the rest of your life doing this and it's very exciting this is the gateway to entomology and i'm glad to be a part of that journey with you so okay um Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Paul. Paul, you brought up a fantastic point. I didn't even think of that, where, you know, we're kind of both ends of the spectrum here, especially moving forward with the AUCC. We're going to have some outdoor, some combined, some glass house. So didn't even put those two together. And um, <clears throat> Heather, whenever you're ready, I will let you take it away. 
All right, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully it goes well. <laughs> All right, so it's going to get. Um, so here it is. I just have to figure out how to get. Um, how do I go? I'm sorry, how do I go full view on Google? It's just not a platform I use a lot to um, present. I so I believe oh, slideshow. Yes. Yay. All right. Thank you. And and what were you going to say? And then just a note for everybody, please feel free. We're going to have some time for Q&A at the end. So go away, go, go ahead on there and Eric and I will moderate the questions. Yeah. So, so start asking questions away. now, if it's pertinent and we could squeeze it in, we will, but we try not to interrupt the flow too much. And mm -hmm. like Paul said, we will hold the Q&A session for the last uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, you know, I know when I get nervous, I tend to blow through slideshows. So that's just me speaking. So if I was doing this, we'd probably have 45 minutes of questions. <laughs> but yeah, Heather, um, I'll let you take it. And Paul yeah. and I will moderate the questions. There is, I'm going to there's, no, myself there's no such thing as a bad question. So don't feel shy. I know sometimes I'm that person like, should I say this? There's a lot of people in here. Please ask me anything, everything. I love to talk about it. And everybody learns from it. So please ask any questions that you have. And so we begin. Welcome to the Cannabis Integrative Pest Management 101 seminar. Again, very thankful to be here. Um, my name is Heather Case with a K, um, and I am a technical sales representative for BioB USA, which is a beneficial insect provider. So today we're going to do another brief introduction. Um, IPM, what is it and why it's important? Tools that are helpful, um, how to scout common pests that you might see, just some of the few that um, when I work with people I typically hear about, and what to do if you spot a pest. So we got a lot to do, and I'm excited to do it with you all. Hi again, I'm Heather Case. I'm, a, like I said, a Northeastern representative for BioB USA. I've worked in cannabis IP, IPM for about three and a half, three years, but I've also done apple orcharding and organic farming. Um, I did apple orcharding in Maryland, and for the organic farming, I worked on the Wegmans organic farm for a few seasons, and it was very lovely. I got my undergraduate degree and, in environmental biology at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. If there's any stumpies out there, please shout out. Um, love to see it. Um, currently working on a graduate degree at The Ohio State University in the Masters of Plant Health Management. So not only do we do entomology, but plant pathology as well. Um, if there's any Buckeyes out there, shout it out. Happy to see you. Um, and my favorite insect is the pharaoh cicada or the 17-year periodical cicada. Now we haven't had a brood up here quite yet, but it's coming and they're gonna be amazing. So get ready, excited, and um, they're gonna be cool. So integrated pest management, what is it? It's a lot of things. But the definition, um, integrated pest management is an effective and environmentally sensitive approach to pest management that relies on a combination of practices. That is underlined because combination of practices is so important to having a successful IPM program. And that includes combining scouting, data collection, identifications, thresholds, which means how many is too many before they start to cause damage. Um, integrating it into your production schedule so it, it's a more natural normalized task that you're doing daily. Um, releasing beneficial insects, mites, and nematodes, which is super cool, and spraying when necessary with a New York State compatible and approved um, pesticide. Um, think of this kind of as a nesting doll where you have one big doll at the end, but there's a lot inside. That's kind of what IPM is, or you know, the gears of your watch, the engine of your car. Everything is working together for that one purpose, which is your plant health. So it's important, and I cannot stress it enough, to do everything that you can together. And I like this graphic. It just kind of reinforces what I talked about, and I think visuals are very important. Um, so you can hang this up on your wall, um, near your desk, just to kind of remind yourself what you have to do. Um, prevention is number one. Prevention is, um, Everyone I talk to hears about prevention. I'm a broken record about prevention, but it's very important. Identification will help you get the right tools that you need for the insects you're dealing with. Monitoring, you know, scouting, recording data, incredibly important for 
um, future um, IPM things that you have to do, it's always good to have historical data. Action threshold. Action threshold is a little bit more of a advanced thing, but just kind of generically, action threshold is when should we do something? When is it too many thrips? When is it too many um, caterpillars? You know, when is it too many of something and what we should do about it? Your management options, um, you know, uh, releasing beneficials or spraying and evaluations. Is this working? Can we do something better? So that's kind of what this is to reinforce the last slide. Again, hang this on the wall, draw a picture of it, do whatever you have to do. This is a really good, um, it's a really good graphic to start with. Why do we do it? Um, not because we just like to add a bunch of things to the to-do list, you know. We already have so much to do. Cannabis is, every moment is precious, and this is also precious. Um, we want to make sure pests do not get out of hand. We know when we have a lot of pests, they decrease the quality of our plant, whether it be um, physically or, you know, it can take down an entire crop depending how bad it is. So let's get ahead of it and let's make sure it doesn't get out of hand to the best of our power. Prevention, like I said, you're gonna hear about it a lot, easier and cheaper. Um, I know sometimes at first it seems like a very big investment, but you're investing in your crop and I promise you from experience, it will be cheaper than reacting to a problem. So prevention is so important. And you wanna ensure a healthy, crop in addition to and beyond traditional production tasks like pruning, defoliating, irrigating, et cetera. You wanna make sure that that's woven in there with all of those things because it's a part of agriculture, horticulture and floriculture. You know, um, it's, it's a part of it that should be happening regularly just like anything else. And that's why we do it to regularly to make sure we, you're not pulling out your hair with just the pest population you have. I've been there and I don't wish it upon anyone. So let's do it, do it preventatively. Tools that will help you with your IPM program. These are essential. This is kind of like my essential list. If people ask me, what should I do? What should I have? It can go beyond this, but this is a really good starting point, I'd say. So a microscope or a hand lens, um, Paul was carrying a Dynalite around with him today when I was scouting with him, which is perfect to have. It's like a little, um, if you haven't seen one, it's like a little um, electric microscope and it's got a light on it too. So that way you can, yeah, there it is. Very cool, it's handheld. Also what you can do is hook it up to your computer. Say you bring some pests back to your office or lab, you hook it up to your computer and you can point to the screen and say, this is a thrip. I want you all to know that. So. Very important to have, and also a hand lens. Um, it comes in this little case, for example. I always wear this around um, just so you're in the field, but basically it's just like a magnifying glass. Um, another name for this could be a jeweler's loop. So when you're on, you know, shopping for things on Amazon or whatever, um, hand lens, jeweler's loop, those will kind of bring up the same tools. Yep, there, there's a good one. It looks like that one has a light on it too, which I like that. This one that I have right here has a stand. So when you kind of get your, you know, you get your insect and you, it's got a stand on it. So that way it's a little bit more stable, but there's a million different things out there. Get what works for you. Scouting sheets. Um, collecting data is incredibly important, like I had mentioned, and I like a sheet to take out in the field to write things down. Some people have programs on tablets and things, which is good. Um, it's essentially the same thing, just digital, but a scouting sheet to help you capture the right information. On a, neck, on a future slide, um, I have an example of a scouting sheet that I pulled from the internet. It's just an example, but it could be a good skeleton of what you kind of want to capture in terms of information. Excel. Um, I know Excel is very scary. Um, Excel is very hard to use. I, I use it um, and I'm still learning, but it's a really good place to put data once you take your scouting sheets or you're putting information right onto a tablet or something to graph your data. I know, um, I don't know if some of you have experienced this yet, but when I was doing IPM for cannabis, I'd have to report up and out. So graphs were a really easy way to show information. Um, visuals are always important. So graphing the information is really easy to do in Excel with just a few commands and things like that. So I would put the data in there after you collect it on your scouting sheet, make a graph, beautiful um, data to look back on. So it's important, you know, say we're in June, you can look back at June of 2021 and 2020 and be like, 
I know that there's going to be broad might at this time of year. Let me get ahead of it. So that's really important to have and it saves you so much time. Monitoring cards, flagging tape. Um, good indicators to yourself and other people that there might be an issue. Monitoring cards are those sticky yellow or blue cards that when you put out, you get stuck in them and you got to wrestle with them a little and they're gridded. Sometimes they're not, but they catch usually like shore flies and winged things like fungus gnats, just to kind of give you a snapshot of what's going on. And the flagging tape is similar. It's not sticky though, but basically you just like tie a ribbon on your trellis or your plant to indicate to yourself and your team that there might be a hot spot over there. So I'm working on it, you know, let's try not to pass by it to make sure we're not taking anything on our clothes. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of, those are kind of tools of visual communication, which I love. Your community is so important. That's why we're here today. Use the people that you know in this community, in this um, association, um, myself, you know, to ask questions. Um, we're all going through the same thing in terms of pests and seasonality. And someone has gone through it before. So reach out and see what's worked for them. It's a good jumping off point, if anything. Um, and you know, you just get to know your neighbors a little better too. So that's always good. And if you have any chemicals on site, if you are spraying, it's very important to have um, pesticide cabinets, SDS and labels have to be on site. And um, collecting your data in a spray sheet, it kind of looks like a scouting sheet, capturing the right information. You have to have that on site legally. So I would also do some research on that too, but just making sure that you have all this all these things on site when you have chemicals, just to keep people safe. So um, that's kind of a whole different ball game, but it is important, just, I wanted to let you know, if you do have things on site, look into getting some of these things, look into what you do need. Um, so that way you have everything and keep everyone safe. Here's some pictures. I love pictures. Um, just to kind of reinforce the tools that we were talking about. So all the way in the left hand corner, we have a um, dissecting microscope. I love a microscope. Um, and if yours has a camera on it, which varies in price range, you know, maybe if you're starting out, start with a dino light. But if you want something a little bit more like in your office, I love a dissecting microscope. If it has a camera on it, you can take pictures, you can work live right on your computer screen. It's very fun for everyone that's walking by and be like, what are you looking at? So it's a good tool. Um, the sticky cards are on here, Excel. Um, we have some butyl rubber gloves on here in the lower right-hand corner, flagging tape. That's your community. Um, you have an astronaut and a scuba diver, of course, as every community has. And then we have our SDS binder. Um, that you keep on site when you have chemicals. So people, if there is um, something that someone has to access quickly in terms of a label, they go right to this binder and open it up. So that's why, I, like I mentioned, it's very important to have this on site if you have chemicals. Heather, uh, just real quick while we're on this slide. Um, yeah. You know, specifically in outdoor cultivation, right? Gloves mm -hmm. may not be on people's minds, right? Uh, especially sure. if you're just working in the dirt. How important is PPE specifically when it comes to IPM, uh, especially if you are dealing with the situation? So PPE is very important um, as well as cultural practices like cleaning your pruners um, between plants, things like that, because, you know, sometimes we have things on our hands that you know, you don't want to get on the plants. Um, so I always like to wear, um, and sometimes in different states in this, in the Northeast, I'm not, I don't quite remember about New York. They required you, you to wear gloves as part of like the sterile growing environment. So I'm not entirely sure, but it's very important um, to have, you know, nitri nitrile gloves. It also keeps you safe from like getting sticky or like if you touch something, you don't want to get that on your skin. So I think gloves are very important. These gloves in particular that are on this slide are butyl rubber. Um, those are more for spraying. Um, and I would not wear butyl rubber every day because you will be drenched in sweat five minutes into your day. And that is terrible. So I would reserve butyl rubber for when you're spraying, if it's in the label. Um, and then nitrile, if you're you know pruning, defoliating, things like that. Um, that is important, I think. Excellent. All right, here we go. This is an example of a scouting sheet. Um, again, I just pulled this offline and this is just a really good 
visual to have. So as you can see, it kind of has, um, it has the date, the crop, the stage, um, you know, the scouting might look a lot different for your veg plants than your mother plants. So it's important to note. Um, and then we can see here that they're looking for onion thrips in particular. Um, the measurement is number of thrips per leaf. That doesn't have to be what you do. You could do per plant, per bay, per row. It's really up to you. Um, this is all up to you. The sample unit is plants, um, of course. <laughs> um, and they're just, it looks like on this, they're just only scouting 50. Um, so it really, again, this is just a generic visual for you to go and look for yourself, create one yourself. Um, people have asked me to help them create some, which um, based on what I have done. So that is also an option, but then, you know, we, so that's important information to hold on to for the future, like I have said. So good example, um, I'd consider doing something similar. If you want to use this, that's great too. Then you have it right here, but very important. All right, we've got our sheets, we've got our microscopes, we've got our hand lenses, let's go scouting. Where do we look? Oh, oh, there was supposed to be a visual, sorry. We look everywhere. So when we're starting out, we're looking everywhere. We're looking at the tops of leaves, the bottoms. We're looking at the stems. We're looking at the flower and the substrate. Um, different pests have um, traditionally specific spots that they like to do. You know, typically um, some of your mite pests will be on the bottom side of the leaf, which is in the obviously the upper right hand corner. So as we start to figure out what's kind of in our crop, then we can hone in on more of these specific places. But, you know, as you're getting stuff in the ground, as you're starting, get in the habit of looking at everything. And then as you're going, we'll hone in on the skill a little bit, but it doesn't hurt to look at everything. You know, you should be aware of what's going on in your crop because of how quickly things can change. So look everywhere. Um, and like I said, it'll get easier as time goes on. So as we're scouting, I recommend, and what I've done is at least one time a week. And I know that can sound like a lot, but it's so important, like I had mentioned previously, things can happen so quickly that um, if, you know, if you're going like two, three weeks without scouting, you might come back to something and be like, oh my God, you know, um, a lot of the times the conditions our cannabis plants grow in are really good for our pests too. So when they're in optimal condition, they're, they're going. So I recommend getting out there really regularly and looking, um, and getting your team involved of the, what pests look like. So they can look when they're doing, um, you know, pruning, defoliating, things like that, because knowledge is power having more eyes on the situation is always a good idea. And then re-educating people regularly will keep everyone in tip top shape, looking and looking frequently. So those are my tips and tricks. And the last bullet, take notes, take so many notes, take as many notes as you can and flag plants if there's an issue and you want a second opinion or you kind of want people to not go around that one. So pretty much some of the things I've talked about, but get out there and get everyone involved. Some of the things we might see. Um, this is just kind of the things that I hear about the most. Now, this might pertain to you, it might not, who knows, um, that it is different for everyone. But these are the, some of the really common things that we see. Um, and this is just, again, very generic, um, what they look like and what they're called. You know, um, we can always later on dive deeper into these things, but let's just, we'll take a first little step in. Um, so as you can see, um, on the upper left-hand corner, we have broad mite and two spotted spider mite. And then in the far right, we have hemp russet mite. This is where your um, hand lenses and dynolites come in handy because these are really hard to see with the naked eye. So you really got to get up in there and look at the, what's going on. So that's why I recommend those types of tools. They're very hard to see. Um, so get the right tools and look they can spread very rapidly. So that's why we say a week to every week scout. Western flower thrips, and in, in addition to other types, you can see without a hand lens. Um, if you have a hand lens or a Dynalite, you could take a picture and then be able to ID it easier. But generally you can kind of see what they're doing and where they are. Um, they have a very famous type of damage. It looks all shiny, but that's for later. Again, you can see these with your eyes. Um, again, the tools help, so um, I would recommend them. 
for some of our outside friends, um, we have European core borer and leaf hoppers. Um, leaf hopper is a very generic term. Um, these are Lepidoptera, which is like moths, moth, um, like caterpillars and things like that. And they chew. You'll see it if and you'll know that they're out there. They like the taste. They'll chew it. Um, so we want to get ahead of that, too, because they can kind of do some a lot of damage. Um, so something to think about. Japanese beetles is um, a chewer as well. They kind of create like um, it looks like your leaf will look like stained glass almost. Um, and these Boy, not. Me. I'm sorry. I call them doilies. It yes. looks like a doily when it's yes. done. Yes, yeah. that's a really good word. I I agree. And Japanese beetles, I've had to deal with, and I do not like them at all. I mean, I don't like any of these, but personally, I do not like them. I think they stink um, <laughs> if you have a lot. Um, and this was an apple orchard, so very different ball game. But um, they're gross, and you might see them. Um, they very famously are shiny. Um, and again, look for the doilies. And with outside, hopefully not inside. If you have these inside, you should talk to the person who built your greenhouse. But outside, you might have some deer. Um, you might have some furry critters like moles or um, groundhogs or things that like to chew on the plants. They taste good. They smell good. So those are on, those are a lot easier to ID. Um, you can still send me a photo. I like to look at the deer. I think they're cute, but I know that they can be a nuisance. Um, so in the next slide, we're going to see some of the ways that we can deal with these uh, things that are presented in front of us right now. A brief intro to pest solutions. And I say brief, and it's in caps locks because this can go into a really deep rabbit hole. So again, we're just taking a small step in to you know, the things that are out there. Um, so we talked about the mites, we talked about the thrips. Um, in the upper left hand corner here, we have types of beneficials um, that we would suggest for any of those. So we have predatory mites, you know, good mites versus bad mites. It's the next Marvel movie. It'll be great. We have parasitoid wasps. And I, I just like to say now that they do not sting people. I do get that question a lot. And that is a, that's a good question. They don't sting people. They're, they're so small and they're only going after aphids. Um, they're very cool. Predatory insects um, like this one, you know, they're, they're like laying their eggs on top of um, bad bug eggs. And when they hatch out, they eat. And then the nematode. The nematode, I'd say, is the the true gateway um, insect or beneficial solution to the world of IPM because I'm sure that a lot of people have heard about it. If not, as you grow, you will because they take care of fungus gnats and fungus gnats is a very, very common problem. Um, so this is the types of beneficials that maybe in the future we can dive deeper on or you can do that research yourself, but this is a good start so you know what to look up. In the left-hand corner, I love this tool. I would Google this and bookmark it. It's the New York State DEC Bureau of Pesticide Management Information Portal. So if you, if you are spraying something, it has to be approved by New York State. And with this tool, you can type in the name of your pesticide um, or the registration number um and look it up to make sure that it's approved for medical cannabis it should say that on the label but if you just want to double check look it up with this tool and it'll it's going to save you a lot of time than you know guessing and i think it just helps you sleep better at night to know that you have this so i would bookmark that um and use it whenever you need it it's it's obviously free it comes from the dc and it's going to help you down the road um below that we have someone putting up deer fence um that will help with the deer. Um, deer can be tricky though. And this sounds like a silly piece of advice, but I promise you from my experience, if you have a gate, close it. Um, that will keep the deer out. Um, when I worked on an orchard, you, you know, we're human and we forget to close the gate all the time. And then we see deer in there munching on our apples and we forgot to close the gate. So closing the gate helps. And I believe Eric also had said something about marigolds. Yes. I was just gonna chime in. Yeah. Um, I, uh, by 2019, I, uh, went to bed one night and I woke up one morning and, you know, kind of my fault for planting where the deer graze, I guess, but I woke up and nearly 300 of my plants, uh, that I had just planted two days before, uh, oh, all no. had the tops chewed off and then spit out right next to where they bit <laughs> it off. So like they didn't even eat it, which pissed me off even more. Um, <laughs> 
And, oh. you know, being a Neanderthal, I called the state and I was like, I need nuisance permits. I have this problem with deer. They didn't allow me to have them because of hemp, of course. Um, so I just did a bit of research and I spoke to some, uh, you know, people in my area that have been farming for decades. And one guy was like, plant some marigolds. And I was like, how many? And he's like, however many you want. Doesn't have to be too many. Just plant them towards the perimeters, intermingle them with some of your plants as a companion plant. And uh, I did that immediately and uh, have continued to do it the past three years and have not had an issue with deer since I implemented some marigold spotted between some of my plants. Yeah, and I actually looked that up after um, you had told me that and they don't, as you had kind of inferred, they don't like the smell. Um, and you can Google that and read a bunch of things about gardeners using that and it seems to work. So not only are they pretty, but they'll keep the deer away. Um, and the last photo on this slide, cleaning is so important and cultural practices like that, you know, um, cleaning after your plants are gone, um, making sure that, you know, if you're using pots, you know, to bleach them before you repot in them, making sure the soil is free of pathogens, cleaning your pruners, that stuff is so important and it is so easy for everyone to do. So clean, 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 and clean. Um, I will never not preach that. So those are kind of the pest solutions that we have this time around. And maybe in the future, we dive deeper into this and it gets super cool. So you took all the advice from this PowerPoint, you have all the tools, you have your notepad, and you went scouting, you looked all over the plant, and you found a pest. The first thing I always say to people is, it's okay, it happens to everyone. Um, growing crops is called an agroecosystem. So sometimes you see a lot of pests, sometimes you don't, just like you would anywhere else in any other ecosystem. So it's very natural to happen and it's okay. It's not your fault. And you're not a bad grower if this happens. You're just a grower and you're going to figure out how to deal with it. So please take that to heart. As some people feel very guilty when they get pests in their crop. It's okay. It happens to everybody and we're here for you. If you are dispersing insects preventatively, which again, I highly recommend, um, we're going to up the ante. And this is called reactive um, or curative. Um, because we have to cure the problem, we're reacting to a bunch of um, bad bugs in our crop. So we're going to increase the amount of good bugs we put in our crop, and they will fight the bad bugs and bring that level back down. If you are using a New York approved um, pesticide, uh, what we typically suggest, say you have a really, really intense number of bad bugs, we would say, okay, go ahead and spray your approved pesticide. Let the let that you know monitor that for a few days, and then release your beneficial insects. It gives them the leg up. Um, so you know just monitor and keep track of when you're spraying, and don't forget to document, like I had mentioned briefly. Um, that's very important. When this time is happening too, scout very carefully. I'd suggest even more than once a week if you're having a problem area, just to make sure the problem is subsiding. Um, and we want to make sure we're keeping track of what works and what doesn't, you know, we don't want to keep putting something out if it doesn't work. And, you know, we're, we're putting a lot of time and money into it. So keep track of what works and what doesn't. And then if you ever have to pull that out of your tool belt again, you already know what to do. And it's a lot less stressful. And tell your team, make sure that your team knows that there's an issue. So they're not, you know, traveling between rooms coming from a room with a pest problem or an area with a pest problem, and they can kind of stay away from that area. Or if you kind of need help monitoring or scouting, you know, get the team involved. Communication is everything. So when you have questions um, like today, <laughs> turn to us, turn to your community. Um, again, everybody's been through something and it's a good time to talk about it and get a jumping off point for what type of research you want to do, how to approach a situation. You know, everybody's, we all grow cannabis and we're all in this association. Talk to your com community. It's a really great tool. And again, get to know your neighbors, whether it be near or far, um, and build those relationships. Take what people say to you um, based on their experiences or research and do more research. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to cook an egg. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do IPM. Um, you know, if I recommend something to one place, 
it's very, very different from the next place, even though they're both growing cannabis, maybe similarly. So research what might work for you. There's a lot of different tools and methods out there that will help you do what you have to do. Learn from your mistakes and successes. That's how we grow. Um, no pun intended, but also, yes, that's how we grow. Um, and again, like, don't, um, it's not your fault. This is just a part of the industry and it doesn't make you a bad grower. It doesn't, you know, mean you're doing something completely wrong. You know, we just have a little, we just have a little hiccup and that's okay. It happens to all of us learn from it and it'll be easier in the future and learn from the data you collect. You know, we collected the data in, um, 2020, 2020, then look at it now and say, okay, we see that something's happening in, you know, July of 2020, let's get ahead of it. So we don't have the headache we had then today. So learn, learn from all, like, learn from your data, learn from your community, learn from um, scientific papers, learn from your mistakes, learn from your successes. And that's why I said at the top of this, you're always going to learn more. And if that's the thing that you take from this, then I feel like this is a success because you're never going to cap out on your knowledge. So always learn, keep learning, learn forever. Um, some of the sources that um, I had maybe talked about um, are here. So um, you can type it into your search bar, Google, what have you. Um, the first one is I, if you have, I love extensions. I love the Cornell extension. I love the Penn State extension. I love them all. Um, They're so awesome. So if you, and they make really good articles that are pretty short, kind of like what I'm doing today, except in an article form. Um, so the first one is PSU, which I think is Penn State University. It's just a reminder of what we've talked about today. Bookmark it if you wanna, you know, maybe um, solidify what you've heard today, but maybe with something different from a different author. Um, the second website, there's a lot of websites out there that um, will show you the crop as well, or the, the crop, the pest and the solution. Um, an example of that is my website, which is BioB. Um, so there's a lot of those out there um, and those are good tools also. The DEC website, the one that I had talked about, I think this is the third picture. I love this tool. That's why I can't stop talking about it. Um, that's, the, that's the URL. Um, so utilize that um, book market and um, save it for later. Um, and it will help you. It helped me a lot, um, you know, bringing in new things. So bookmark it. And then um, New York State IPM is a program that Cornell runs. I love their extension. Um, every month they do a thing called What's Bugging You? And it's about a different, a wide breadth of different pests and crops and things. And that's a nice thing to get a part of, kind of similar to this, but um, there's a lot of different topics they do. So I highly recommend that. And that is the end of our um, informational session. Um, I think they, so if you have any questions, we can talk about them now. And if you can't think of one now, or you want to just email me, this is my email. Um, please, you know, screenshot it, type it down, whatever you want to do. Um, I would love to hear from you. I think the Aureus are supposed to like dance. Oh, there he is. The first one was supposed to do like a little thing, but that's okay. He's a little shy. <laughs> um, so I, again, I'm so thankful that I got to do this. I love talking about IPM. This could go on for like three more hours, but it's late. <laughs> so um, I would love to answer some questions and talk yeah, more. <laughs> um, hi there. Uh, it is 644. You could not have timed that any better. It's like you're a professional or something. So yeah, thank you for getting through that at exactly the precise moment. Oh, good. I'm glad um, I did that. Yeah, we do have a, a, a few questions. Um, I guess I'll start with them as they came in. Sure. Uh, Emily Long wants to know, would you consider indoor air quality as part of IPM for indoor cannabis cultivators? Um, for example, stopping spread of fungus with environmental controls and technology. I know that's, that's really, kind of. That's a great question. Um, and maybe I didn't, uh, I kind of um, lightly touched on this at the top, but I'll just say again, um, part of my background, not only is the entomology, the IPM with the bugs, but also plant pathology. So um, part of my time as an IPM person in cannabis is working with fungal and bacterial um, pathogens. So 
that is kind of a part of IPM, but it, it should fall more on the um, responsibilities of QA, QC. Typically it does just because they are doing quality control. Um, in my experience, they collect the um, air sample with a machine. Um, I didn't know how to use it. And then they send the sample off. Um, the people at the facility, they send it to IDEA and send it back. Um, where IPM might fall in that is looking at that list once it's ID'd and being like, is this a plant pathogen or is this just a normal spore that exists in everyday life? Um, so that might be where it kind of comes into play. Um, if it doesn't affect the plant, it probably is not IPM, it's more QAQC. Okay. We have uh, two questions from anonymous attendee. They're two separate questions, but they both kind of fall into the same. So I'm just gonna merge them. Forgive me anonymous, but I think we could get away with it this way. Um, <clears throat> said, we are seeing what we believe to be leaf hoppers on the plants. Uh, as you had mentioned, leaf hoppers come in many different colors and shapes and can be a little bit different to pinpoint exactly. Um, says, and they are eating the leaves. Uh, we read that neem oil is the best option for commercial growers. Is that what you'd recommend? Um, and uh, he also had a question about strategy for monitoring thrips. Um, I'm just gonna take the neem oil one real quick. Uh, yeah. I know neem oil is quite a popular go-to in a lot of cases. Um, it is possible though that it can cause you to fail um, some pesticide tests, uh, depending on when you sprayed, how much you sprayed, if it's not diluted properly. Um, so there are a lot of things that are traditionally used in, you know, uh, at-home cultivation or, you know, uh, cultivating in general. Um, I do know in cannabis though, it is possible if you spray neem oil during flowering that it can get in the flower itself and can cause to fail a test, uh, especially with the strict testing protocols that we have now with uh, the adult use recreational market. Um, but if you have anything to add uh, for the leaf hoppers and thrip monitoring, please. Uh, okay, so with the leaf hoppers, I would, what I would suggest is um, looking for a product that is labeled for it. If you are spraying neem oil at the right time, as Eric had said, and it is labeled for leaf hoppers, I would recommend it. If you're spraying something that doesn't have it on the label, it might not work. Um, so when it comes to spraying, read the label and see if it fits the New York's, New York's um, requirements for what you can and can't spray and make sure that it has leaf hoppers labeled on there. Um, what I would also recommend too is um, there is um, biocontrol for that as well. So if you having a hard time finding something and your leaf hopper populations are kind of low, I would use um, bios because um, you don't you won't uh, fail testing for bios um, and there's no REI for bios. So you have two options. I would just do a little research and see what you can use um, and whether or not you want to use bios. For thrip monitoring, um, that's a good question. It really depends on how you want to do it. How I've done it in the past um, is I like um, I like quantitative information, just numbers. I don't like personally, and I don't like paragraphs of words. Um, a lot of the times, if you have to present up and out, people don't want to read paragraphs of words, and maybe you don't in the future either. So what I like to do is I make like a scale from one to three. One is minimal, we've observed minimal thrips on, say if you're indoor, maybe like a whole room, for example, we've seen minimal thrips on um, all the plants in this room. Two might be, we've seen thrips on 50% of the plants in this room. And three might be, we've seen thrips on over 50% or 100% of the plants in this room. So that's an example of how I monitor for thrips. Um, it, you can do it very differently. And if you are out there researching, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I just like to do it that way. Cause then when I'm scouting a whole room or a whole area, I'll be like, this area was a one, this area was a two, this area was a, so that's how I like to do it. Um, feel free to use that if it works for you. If you want some more information, please email me and we can dive into like a more specific um, plan for your crop. We have a uh, question from Travis Williams. Do you suggest using 
Dipple BT for leaf hoppers and grasshoppers. Okay. Um, Dipel, I per, in my personal experience, I haven't used a lot, and um, for and I haven't I've used it a little, but not for the purpose that you're using it for. Um, it's been a long time since I've looked at the label for Dipel. Um, I have a re, I have um, a pesticide license for the state of New York, but I haven't sprayed a pesticide maybe in like a year or two. So like I had said to someone before, read the label. If it if it um, says that it will um, help with leaf hoppers, use it. And then as we kind of talked about in this PowerPoint, monitor and see if it works for you. If it doesn't, maybe try something else. If it does, that's a lot easier. And like I had mentioned before too, there are biocontrol options for that. So that gives you kind of another um, realm of possibilities as well. But again, check the label see if it works for you and think of think of the options that you have. So that's what I would say to that. Uh, there was a, I'm having trouble finding, it was in the general chat. It was in regards to uh, Japanese beetles. Um, we know they're an invasive species. Uh, if you're a hemp farmer in New York, outdoor farmer, you've had experience with Japanese beetles. Um, I have found personally at my farm um, that they would chew some fan leaves here or there, but never really did more, did any sort of serious damage to any plant. Um, and then once the hemp started flowering, they would kind of disappear. So they would really only be present from like early end of June, early July through maybe early August. Um, but what I did notice is that there were certain weeds that would grow in between my rows and, uh, you know, one day I'm just kind of going and doing cutting in between my rows, making sure nothing's overgrowing. And uh, I just noticed that I, I can't remember the name of the, the, the weed. I looked it up. I can't remember offhand. My apologies. I'll have to dig through my notes. Uh, but like Heather said, keep notes because that's how you remember things. Um, it's got a very broad leaf, similar to like a Monstera, if anybody's familiar with them. And uh, there would be hundreds of Japanese beetles on this one big broad leaf. And uh, then I just decided that, you know, I pulled one out, it just had a tap root, it didn't have a broad root system. So I wasn't worrying about competition in my roots or anything like that. So whenever I saw those, I would just keep them there. And lo and behold, the Japanese beetles stayed off of my hemp and would only go to those, you know, that weed that was growing. Um, so it was just kind of like mother nature helping me with some companion planting. Um, so on Japanese beetles specifically, I did notice that, you know, just look around. There may be things growing around your outdoor crop that they may like better than your hemp. And if so, let them be and, you know, let them go after those. Yeah, um, I totally agree with that. In my experience, orcharding, um, they really liked small plants, but they loved the vining weeds, too. Um, something that we did in that scenario, and it may or may not work for you, but um, we had pheromone traps. So basically the, the pheromone trap is putting off the pheromones of the Japanese beetles. So they think they're going to a mate. Um, to me, it smelled like Nag Champa. So it's not really that bad and it's safe to handle. And basically it was um, in a little container and below it was like a funnel and a bucket. So they would go to go towards this pheromone and fall into the trap. Um, and then they would stay there. Where I was in Maryland on the apple orchard last summer, fill in half a day, empty it twice a day. So they do work, they attract a lot of beetles. And I suggest putting them around your problem areas and perimeter, especially if you're near a wooded area. But again, companion planting works. Um, the pheromones traps work, see what works best for you. Maybe it's both. So um, options, There's a, like I said, there's a million ways to cook an egg with this. So see what works best for you. Uh, uh, there's another question in the chat here. That I think it's really important, Heather, is, um, you know, there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of legacy growers that are going into this legal market. And I'm just very fearful of people just using what they've used in the past and, you know, not being able to pass a test. So I'd love to get your opinion on uh, this question that came from, I guess, Ryan about uh, Pythereum and Azadractrin base sprays and when you would use them and how far into flower you think you can get away with that and you know or if there's any other legacy 
market sprays that you just, you know, you can't use now if you're going into legal. So, okay. Um, so in my experience, I've used azadiractin. Um, azadiractin helps with insects, um, of course. And typically a lot of the time people will use it as a dip or um, as a spray. Um, and I think that works. Azadiractin is allowed in New York State, at least to my knowledge as of right now, um, I have used that. Pyrethrins, um, that's what I would kind of use if it was more problematic. Um, because the REI is a little higher, I believe, um, I think, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, make sure you read the labels. Off the top of my head, I believe that if you use azadiractin, it might have a one hour REI, whereas a pyrethrin might have a four hour REI. So that's that's one part of it to take into consideration. It might slow down your workflow. I I think that um, if you are going to use a product and you know there's a lot, like you said, there's a lot of legacy growers coming into this. There's some people who are starting this that just aren't familiar with pesticides. Look it up on the New York State DEC website. Um, that is pretty up to date um, and it'll give you a clear answer whether you can use it for your crop or not. If you don't want to do that, um, which I highly suggest, there is a type of pesticide that typically I've used in my experiences of pesticide sprayer in New York State. It's called FIFRA 25B products. FIFRA 25B products are, they don't have an, um, a registration number because it's been deemed um, that it's not necessary to have because it's passed a lot of criteria for safety, environmental safety, um, human safety, things like that. So look into those as well. And in a lot of states, I work in you know the entire Northeast and um, truthfully, Massachusetts is really, really strict, but they're allowed to use FIFRA 25B products. Um, look them up regardless, but a lot of those FIFRA 25B products, they're typically oils like um, peppermint oil, like things like that. Those are typically okay to use, but I cannot stress this enough. Look it up on that tool first, read the label, ask your community if they're using it. Um, but specifically for azadiractin and pyrethrins, those are things that I have used. And in terms of spraying, um, I don't like to spray after trichome development just because sometimes the pressure of the sprayer, if it's not correct, can cause some damage. And also I kind of just don't want to meddle with it after that, but if it's necessary, um, typically your pre-harvest interval, which is how close to harvest can I spray, with those types of things is really low, sometimes zero. So that's in the label too. So when you're using these, read the label. Um, when you're getting registered for your pesticide license, they will stress that a hundred million times. So I'm also going to stress it a hundred million times. Read the label um, for those types of things if you're unsure. And uh, just to piggyback on that, it was there's another question, Casey O'Brien. Uh, what do you suggest for botrytis mold during flowering? I've used Bacillus subtilis bacteria, uh, brand name Cease in the past on outdoor cannabis uh, with limited success. Uh, I will say that the Bacillus, I know that they're testing for on testing labs for pesticides. Um, one, I, I had an issue last year and uh, I was told to use that. Um, you know, uh, I was working with the Cornell Extension and uh, they had recommended it, especially with my organic certification and whatnot. Um, and uh, I used it before my plant started flowering. Uh, once my plant started flowering, I did not use it uh, just because I looked up what they're actually testing for on these full panel pesticide screenings. Um, so if you go to like a testing website, uh, Botanicor or one of the New York State uh, testing labs, um, even go to the New York state regs on the cannabis, the AUCC, there's testing regs. Um, you can see the list, uh, especially even on the medical side, you could see the list of what is, what they're testing for. Um, it may not show you the actual limits, but that's a good indicator to not use during flowering. Um, again, uh, Paul kind of leaned into it a little bit before a lot of legacy growers who are used to spraying certain things coming into the legal market and although have had great success and it may not be the worst thing in the world, these testing restrict, these testing limits are strict and the slightest thing can cause one lot to fail and we don't want to do that. So check what they're testing for, check the ingredients on the bottle 
and then you know use your judgment from there but you know try it's a double-edged sword right you don't want botrytis but you also don't want to fail a test so it's it, it's kind of a catch-22 in some situations unfortunately but uh hopefully we have some better answers for you soon once the uh full testing regs come out right and bacillus subtilis and all bacillus species though they're amazing and uh, just a marvel of nature um in my opinion when people are testing for microbials and cannabis that is bacillus is a bacteria so it may or may not come up and that is exactly what eric is saying for botrytis um so um what there's a there's a few things that I would do. So botrytis is a detritivore, which means that it feeds on dead material mostly. So if you are, you know, in the crop and you notice there's a branch, maybe it got cut by accident and it's like hanging over and it's rest in peace, take that out of there. Take your um debris out of there. Um and some products that I would recommend that I think are labeled, again, check the label. Um Xerotol 2.0 might be labeled for botrytis. Xerotol 2.0 is a fungicide and an algicide and a bactericide, I believe. It's hydrogen peroxide and proxy acetic acid. So it's not microbial at all. Um, and that has been used, I believe, for that. I used to use it for powdery mildew, knock on wood. I know everyone hates that word. Um, I've used it for that. Um, but check the I, I sound like a broken record and I apologize. I can't give more specific information, but with these products, it is so important to check the label to make sure that it says it will work with that thing. And that will give you the answer that you need. But some of the places I would check first, Xerotol 2.0, uh, Prosidic 2. Um, I've used it for PM. I don't entirely remember what the label entails, but Prosidic 2 is a FIFRA 25B product. Like I mentioned, it has no registration number and is labeled, I believe, for medical cannabis indoor and outdoor. So I would look into that. Um, what it is, is it is um, citric acid. And basically what it does is it changes the pH of your leaf surface to make it inhabitable for the fungus trying to grow there. So I'd look at that too. And those are the two off the top of my head that I would think of. Um, a lot of our solutions, um, you know, Bacillus subtilis works because what it does is when you spray it on the plant, it kind of can compete for um, space. And sometimes um, Bacillus, you know, it also works for you know, insects too, but it has toxins in it that can kill those types of things. And that that's like cannabis IPM, like 300 or 301, you know? So, um, but I would check Xerotol 2.0. Prosidic um, too. Yeah. So sorry to interrupt you, Heather. This has been awesome. Um, one thing for all outdoor cultivators, I've been noticing the past four years um, that there is a direct correlation between botrytis and caterpillars. And there is like so often, and I can't speak for indoor um, or greenhouse, but in so many cases, I follow the caterpillar droppings or tunnels back to the source and origin of botrytis and the environment that creates that. And so thinking of botrytis proactively outdoors, how to begin to combat or prevent um, caterpillars and caterpillar damage, which is just, you know, it's, it's across the country when it comes to caterpillars. And I've seen that, but really in New York state, specifically on CBD dominant varietals um, has been a correlation between uh, caterpillars, caterpillar poop, and then um, like origin sources of botrytis in the garden. And so maybe, you know, it's creating the optimal environment to allow it to, to kind of generate and then it can spread in other ways. But that's been just something I've been following and something to keep an eye out for. Okay, yeah, let me, let's, um, so I would have to do research about that to see if there's scientific data that says that, because that's really interesting. Um, but if we think about it like this, so caterpillars are chewing on your plants. Um, and what that does is that leaves dead tissue. Um, funguses, much like insects, are opportunists. Um, a lot of the times you'll see, you can see insects and fungal or bacterial pathogens on plants that might have a health issue. So if you have a caterpillar feeding on a plant that has created open wounds, that might be a really good place for a spore to get into. Now that is just kind of like thinking through how um, the ecosystem works. I have not read anything that, um, like in the scientific community, in the biological community that 
you know, can support that, but um, I can do some digging. Um, and if I find something, share it with you to share outward to this community. But um, anecdotally, for example, um, I've talked about working on the orchard a lot. And, you know, I, as I had shown before, we had cicadas and they also chew on young trees and make really open wounds. And with that being said, we had all these open wounds and there is a bacterial pathogen out there called fire blight that like oozes down. So we can probably say that because this happened, you know, because the cicadas are chewing, because the caterpillars are chewing, that gives an opportunity for something to get in. It gets in the vascular system. It eats away at the, the epidermis of the plant. That is a possibility, I think. Um, but again, I would have to do more research to say confidently that that is the case. Appreciate that. Yeah, of course. I think you're on mute. Sorry, I thought I hit the button, but my thing <laughs> did not work on that one. Uh, Heather, you have been absolutely amazing. I uh, cannot thank you enough for this. Um, believe uh, we're out of questions and we're at that time. Um, appreciate you. Uh, if you have any uh, kind of last things you want to say, please be my guest, Heather. Um, or Paul or Zach, if anybody has anything else. But other than that, uh, in the chat, uh, everybody uh, is been very pleased with what you've been letting them know. And uh, we just wanna let everybody know this is a 101. Um, so it's just kind of intro to IPM. Uh, I know a lot of us have some experience with IPM, some maybe don't, but like you said, Heather's email is right here. Uh, you can reach out to Heather, you can reach out to myself, Zach or Paul. And uh, we are happy to try to help in any way we can. So thank you, Heather. I want to thank you, uh, Paul, Zach. Thanks for being part of the best damn education committee in the state. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I think that um, this association is really awesome. I've known about them for years myself, just working in cannabis. Um, and I've seen them in Albany, which is awesome. And like I had said, if you take anything away from this, always keep learning um, and prevention is key. Um, so I hope that this helped you. And I hope maybe in the future, you know, maybe there's more things that we can talk about together. And I hope I can meet some of you and talk to some of you. So please reach out. I would really love to hear from you. Thanks, Heather. Thank you so much. Everyone have a nice night and stay hydrated because it's night, really hot everybody. outside. Stay hydrated. Yeah. yeah, stay hydrated. That's the other thing you have to take from this. We're going yes. back in the hot greenhouse now. Let's go. All yeah. right. I got my water right. bottle. Got my one. There we go. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. All right. Have good good night. night. Have a good night.